Okay, very good. Welcome everyone to this uh, closing session. My name is Mons uh, Molander. I am Nordic Director of Human Rights Watch. And it's a great pleasure to moderate this last panel. And before we start, I want to make just three quick remarks. One is that this is the closing panel. So we aim to bring together the perspectives that we have been discussing over these two days. And that brings me to my second point, that we want it to be an, as interactive as possible. So we want to include you. We know there are numerous experts and a lot of experience in the room. And please already now prepare your questions, because we want to hear what you have to say, both reflections, but also questions to the panel. And thirdly, just a point of order, and that is that we are not all native uh, English speakers in the room, so speak clearly and speak slowly. That's my message to the panel and to all of you who will make interventions from now. But as I said, we have a panel, we have an excellent panel, consisting of some new faces to you and some old. Uh, we have people <laughs> participated in panels before. So you've heard them uh, maybe before, been introduced. First, we have Marco Lecto, who is the research director at uh, Tampere Pitts Research Institute. We have Hanna Klinge, who is a deputy CEO at CMI Marco Actisari Peace Foundation. We have Isabel Bramsen, who you had the pleasure of listening to earlier today, who is a director of peace and conflict studies and also associate professor at Lund University. And we have Hayden Haldorsson, who is communications advisor at WHO with a lot of experience of humanitarian communication in crisis situation. So I want to start with you, Marco, because you are the initiative taker to this panel. Uh, the title of this panel is Nordic Peace Revisited. And could you share your thoughts on that line, please? Yes, yes, thank, thank you. Uh, I think in the end of a kind of a two days conference, it, it, or Congress, it, it's a good to return to discuss about the Nordics themselves and have a critical look mm -hmm. about the Nordics and their peace promotion. And perhaps looking also forward, how, how the kind of a Nordic uh, position in the world and how they're doing the peace in the future would look like. And I, that's, it's trying to do in, in, in some uh, nutshell. And I think we have learned during these couple of days that, that, uh, that the position Nordic have accept, kind of a, accepted this kind of a global do good or, or, or global hu humanitarian great power or peace nation is a rather complex position and, 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 and it, it because it's already created a certain kind of asymmetry uh, between the helper and, and, and the victim the needed to be helped. And, and furthermore, it is really kind of a uh, uh, complex and, and position because it's being needed a, a certain kind of international order, this kind of a liberal multilateral order where it's being created. And when this order is declining, the Nordics and need to find a new position in, in the world. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, in, in the panel which I participated in the peace research, the minister refers in, in the beginning of his speech about this kind of a Nordic of peace. So the, how the Nordic uh, kind of a constitute a kind of a, a non-war zones, deep security commodity or, or, or zone that, that it's, there's no war between. And, and, and I think that's good in here to put the differences between the Nordic of peace which have a very long history. We can have a hundred years or even 200 years of kind of a history that a Nordic for peace, so that the Nordic aims to promote the peace globally and elsewhere, because that have a much shorter history. Of course, you have a prehistory of a Nordic peace kind of a, 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 a kind of building and, and, and in Cold War and certain humanitarianism in there, but it actually, the Nordic for peace emerged and, and, and cherished in, in late 90s, early 2000s, as a part of a emerging liberal multilateral order. So it's very much integrated in, into this order. And the question is, is then, uh, 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 what kind of added value the Nordic brings in, in this kind of a larger multilateral uh, liberal order? And I think in, in my, my kind of a thing is, is that even it's been quite often kind of a argued uh, differently that the Nordics are some kind of a normal entrepreneurs, a kind of a reformers. I think they, they have not been in, in so much of that. They ended in this kind of a, a liberal order more as, as adapt a kind of a 
adapted these kind of normative principles and becoming a guardians or prosecute kind of or, or, or these uh, uh, no existing norms, not so much as changing them. But in, internally, they have a kind of have a, a lot of influence on, on, on the kind of developing practices of peace building. So have, they have, have a certain the imprint on, on, on bringing up this kind of a Nordic kind of a, uh, importance of a looking specific society actors and more on that. That's I don't don't claim. But it's also in third things that the, this kind of a Nordic for peace is entering in, in, in the kind of a peace building, peacemaking, have have an added value for Nordic state themselves. It, it's been kind of a building up of the reputation of a small state. It's a gaining of a status and position within this kind of a liberal order when, where they, they have no muscles, no great power. So to be a kind of a peace nation, humanitarian great power, have given a prestige and position. And, 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 and that is also good, good to remember. Uh, so uh, and then another thing which before going on think about how the things look and on these, that this Nordic of peace and a Nordic for peace, they are inter uh, kind of linked, but not straightforward. They are a bit in complex way interlinked and, and quite long they have been quite separated. There's the same kind of a duality existing in Nordic thinking that here in the Nordic, uh, some kind of a deep peace prevails. You don't need to think about that. We, it, it's already here. There's a, and, 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 and then we can call, there are non-peace world where we are going and, and, and promoted a peace, we make it a bit sim simplified. And that, that is kind of a, but what is happening in recently, in, in during the recent conflicts, I think this, this kind of a relationship is been changing and there's a lot of confusion in Nordic sources about their position in, in, in these. Uh, one of the things which has been generally changed is Russia's war in Ukraine, which brought the interstate war back into Europe and a given kind of uh, in, within the Nordics, especially in Finland and Sweden, idea that, well, there could be also threats so that the, the kind of wars doesn't belong not only history in, in Europe, but there can be, can be reality and a reconfusion. That kind of a uh, return. Uh, the answer on this kind of anxiety was kind of looking uh, uh, the security guarantees, military allies that joined the NATO and turning from a peace to the more a security oriented talk. Another, perhaps a big changing point was the end of Afghanistan operation because it, and all, and, and, and in all kind of Nordic states, at least in Finland, Norway and Sweden have written a report how, what happens and how, how, how we manage there. And it's created a lot of self-critical uh, discussion about the, the, the Nordic peace building and peacemaking and realizing that not all peace building is, is just doing good, that we can do harm with the, with the peace building. And, 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 and uh, Nordic has been not very good on, on meeting this kind of uh, a criticism towards this kind of uh, the peace building effort. And I think that is a, the result is, is all kind of, uh, on one hand, authoritarian challenge about the kind of multilateral order is, is and also, on another hand, this kind of a decolonial critique, which also targeted the, the, the Nordics, the result is confusion. Mm. And then comes on the, the things which I think about in here is that what is a, uh, how the things look in, in future. And I think I have a three kind of a, mm. uh, 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 models where I think that you can see that they are coming and that they're existing there. Maybe they are not exclusive, uh, 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 but it, it, it the first is securitized peace, and that is a, the new tendency that, that, that the kind of a peace is seen more through the national security interest. Not only in, in uh, it's certainly in, within the Europe now, when we talk about the, uh, the war in Ukraine, but also in, in, in broadly. There are more on discussion that, that, that the, uh, as in, in, in that the peace building or crisis management should be targeted in, in the areas uh, uh, where the, the potential kind of refugees are coming and we solve the issues and not stopping the kind of refugees. So it's more or less a very instrumentalized. This is kind of see the, a lot of examples already that. Uh, are we going in that direction? We don't so, but if it's so, I think that it's meaning also that, that the kind of a, the peace building as we knowing would be more marginalized. And it's obvious that at the same time, it's losing its, its importance to build up a kind of a prestige in this kind of a order, in a new kind of a order. The second option, and actually there are two, two kind of a, 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 a alternative there, uh, to, the Nordic still continues to be a very normative actor. And the first, 
and, 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 and it's a kind of based on still continuing on this, enhancing the liberal peace. Uh, and, and I think that there are elements that we can call the, the Nordic still as the last crusaders of the liberal peace. The kind of dinosaur so that, that doesn't understand that the world is changing and they needed to kind of a reform of their thinking about the peace. Mm -hmm. And that's concerning more on the states than, than a, perhaps the kind of a, a, a non-state actors in, in, in Nordic. Mm -hmm. This is how they are reacting in, in, in for example, I, I think in, in looking for the Human Rights Commission in EU and how, how they, they're discussing and reacting and trying to pushing the same issues there uh, 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 than, than, than always, and not perhaps understanding that the world, world is changing. Uh, alternative way of to be a normative actor could be, and that I don't see too much on sign of that, but to return uh, really to be a, a kind of a, uh, a Nordic actor, to be returning something which was in Cold War time, a Nordic exceptionalism, to, to say that, that Nordics have a something a kind of a added value for the Europe and for the whole globe, and that there are some Nordic values to build up. Um, so far, it's hard to see any kind of a step on, on that direction, but I think this kind of actors would really much need it within Europe especially, mm. because the, the someone need to build up a new peace systems in the Europe. Mm. Mm. Perhaps in globe, perhaps it's saving the UN, but that this also kind of vulnerable position, if there are no kind of a, universal kind of a, a normative basis anymore mm. to standing in your own, own norms. Okay. But the last mm. uh, is, is, is the kind of a Nordics and how they have traditional to be very pragmatic actors. So on the hand, the Nordics have tried to be very normative, but also very pragmatic. And I, I, I think that is a direction where we have also a lot of empirical uh, kind of ev evidences. If you look about how many of uh, Nordic non-state actors, NGOs, non-profit actors mm. have been doing the peace kind of supporting, mm. peace mediation, peace building during the last years. It's more close to on the, this kind of a pragmatic approach, not normative approach. They're engaging with the local actors, necessitating a kind of a, a local solution, uh, not kind of a given an, an, uh, uh, direction for the kind of a, for the peace processes, but trusting from the locally kind of a generated a piece. Mm. And, and we have a good examples on this kind of a, I, I, exam, uh, kind of things in, for, for many Nordic actors. And I think that if we build kind of a listening uh, 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 panels, for example, today, it, it, it's very close to the, what, what the many of us in here are sharing how the piece perhaps should be promoted because peace cannot be exported. It's always a locally, uh, 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 a locally kind of a made so that that you can perhaps support, but it, 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 it's a local who are doing the piece and on their own own way, and then you should perhaps give it an, an a direction and on, on, on that. Mm. It's Thank all. It's uh, yeah. And uh, Michael, we need you to wrap up there so we can uh, go to. I, I think that here he we call in, in in the 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 way we can talk about. I think that Hanna will talk about how actually. The, this kind of a very pragmatic approach is doing and what kind of examples we have on, 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 on how, how it works in, 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 in the practice. Excellent, excellent. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, just for the structure, we will hear introductory remarks from all the four panelists before we open up for comments uh, from you to each other, but also uh, then moving on to the Q&A. And we intend to devote roughly half the time of the session to Q&A, so hopefully you will be engaged. And Hanna, you have, uh, I could say, represent an organization with a more practical experience and pragmatic experiences maybe also from, from mediation, so please. Thank you. And thank you, Marco, that was a, a great conceptualization and um, a sort of broader ca uh, canvas to my um, uh, points on, on the sort of more practical uh, end of the spectrum. Um, to those of you who don't perhaps know um, CMI Marti Ahtisaari Peace Foundation, so thoroughly a few words about the background, um, which also reflects perhaps the development of the field as a whole in, in the Nordics and, and perhaps also in, in broader terms. Um, as you know, Marti Ahtisaari, um, uh, former president of Finland, founded uh, CMI in the year uh, 2000. Uh, he had options um, after his presidential term in, in uh, Finland uh, as a former high-level UN diplomat. He was offered 
significant uh, international tasks as well, but he instead thought that the world is still missing um, an international, not international, independent organization uh, that could tackle uh, some of the vicious root causes of conflicts through mediation and dialogue. So he founded uh, the organization to prevent and resolve violent political conflicts. He firmly believes uh, still that all conflicts can be resolved and so, so uh, do we at CMI. So what has happened in the, in the past 23 years um, is that from a very small five uh, person strong um, support function to his activities, CMI, according to uh, Marti's vision, has now turned into a professional uh, team of 100 experts active in four different regions and, and two uh, thematic areas. And um, I'd say that uh, CMI is quite unique in the Nordic setting. Um, there are other organizations who have activities that are very similar to ours. Um, but many of these organizations are either uh, founded by the state or linked to the state, uh, a state agency, or they do research or have a multi-mandate um, uh, perspective. But CMI is very much focused on uh, dialogue and, and mediation still. And the independence of the organization uh, lies on a, a couple of pillars. Um, it's independent analysis that drives um, uh, and informs our work, uh, the uh, initiatives we take. Uh, we are independent in our decision making. We don't have a, uh, a governing board uh, made of donors. And uh, finally, the, the funding base is broad enough to ensure our um, independence. Then how has the Nordic um, canvas, the background, uh, served uh, CMI uh, in its work? I think it has really been important for us that we have the Nordic background, the Finnish background, and this was also our, our founder's um, vision to really embrace um, the achievements in the Nordic societies. But as Marco said very rightly, um, peace cannot be exported. We, we can only offer inspiration and support. Um, we can offer models, uh, we can offer uh, uh, views and insights and organize study visits for conflict parties in their different contexts, but they will have to come up with the solutions themselves. So CMI feels that we are uh, accompanying them and supporting them in their journey. And of course, one critical point is that we only act upon request. We don't impose our services onto anyone, but um, only, only go when we are asked to and leave when we are asked to, um, to go. So the, uh, over the past uh, days, we've heard uh, many of the um, uh, attributes that are linked to Nordic countries. Um, we are seen as pragmatic, uh, discreet, uh, we don't have a colonial background. We don't have skin in the game, so to speak. We are attached to multilateral systems and also have a fairly good track record in, in peacemaking. And this works uh, very well uh, in support of CMI's um, mission as well. But also I do want to um, still make a point about the Finnish background, which is different from perhaps the Nordic um, uh, image or brand a uh, little bit. Yesterday we had about 200 years of peace in the Nordic region, which is not quite accurate actually in terms of Finnish history. And when we work with conflict parties and sort of explain who we are and where we come from, I think the Finnish, uh, the bloody history of Finland actually resonates quite well. We were a development country uh, not uh, much more than uh, 100 years ago. Uh, we went from autonomy to independence to very uh, brutal civil war, came through that somehow and started building uh, the strong institutions and the social cohesion that then manifested in the winter, winter war. Um, and then again, after those wars, uh, how, how was the society built and how come we are now on top of many indexes and the happiest country in the world, believe it or not. And this is uh, the story that uh, resonates and also our geopolitical position that has never changed and will never change uh, next to a very big uh, neighbor that we have to uh, take into account. So these are, uh, this is the background. 
And then a few words, if you still allow, on complementarity. How the Nordic peace uh, ecosystem works uh, from the point of view of an independent organization or NGO. There's the state actors um, responsible, of course, uh, for any activities in the multilateral uh, systems. Um, state actors who can offer uh, services, good offices, um, and so, so on and so forth. Um, then the NGO actors who can support these uh, things, uh, work or serve as a secretariat, um, help with uh, questions around access, um, and of course vice versa. But there's a, in the Nordic countries, I think the cooperation between the state and the NGO uh, actors in this field is a statement of um, a very uh, strong society in, in itself. So we work quite closely with um, the Finnish uh, MFA, uh, Norwegian MFA and the Swedish MFA and really value very highly the support uh, they give to us and enable us uh, to work. Uh, it goes very much beyond funding, but I have to say funding is a, is a great deal and, and the support these Nordic governments offer to uh, independent actors also beyond Nordic countries uh, has a systemic uh, impact and I really hope that this will not change. So, um, yeah, maybe these, these are, yeah. are my opening points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, excellent comments. Uh, we continue directly to Isabel Bramsen. Mm -hmm. and I know you have a PowerPoint. I do, uh, but not an actual PowerPoint. It's just pictures uh, sort of to wake you up at this uh, very last uh, <laughs> uh, hour of the conference. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, but I will relate to the pictures. It's not just for fun. Uh, but. Uh, I, uh, I want to sort of take point of departure in these opening remarks in a report uh, that was also mentioned yesterday that I conducted with a colleague of mine, Anina Hegeman, uh, who was at the scene yesterday. And, and this report um, we were asked to do by the Nordic Council on sort of Nordic cooperation on peace and uh, uh, sort of conflict resolution. And uh, the report is called New Nordic Peace. And uh, uh, when we sort of were asked to do so, uh, we of course consulted uh, researchers as we are, we consulted the literature, you know, what is the Nordic uh, model on, on peace. Um, and there uh, we fell over uh, the professor of Uni University of Copenhagen, and as we were saying, anyone trying to look for a Nordic model for peace uh, will be really challenged. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, it, it's not a thing any longer. This was 2017, he said that. Um, and then we're like, okay, interesting. Uh, but then we traveled to all the uh, Nordic uh, <laughs> um, capitals and talked to people at the MFA, at CMI, and different sort of conflict resolution um, organizations. And there actually we found a different story, which is much more story of sort of bottom up, that maybe if we look at the policy papers or sort of uh, the academic papers on Nordic, uh, on the Nordic model for peace, it's maybe less uh, of a thing, but if we look, uh, talk to people working on peace and conflict at an everyday basis, well, it was very much a story of, well, in the field, yes, of course, we work together, uh, you know, it's, but it's much more organic. It's not like necessarily written into uh, policy documents and so on, but it's, 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 in practice it just happens, uh, one of the interviewers said. Uh, so that's why at the front page of, of the report we have this beautiful picture of memoration, uh, which is this you know, bird formation uh, where you know, on the ground, or this is actually in the air, <laughs> uh, they move you know, much more organically according to each other. It's not like this is the direction, let's go. It's more like you know, whatever, uh, very this pragmatic approach, what happens uh, in the air or in the field. Uh, and uh, that's why we had this picture. And I have another picture uh, that maybe should have been uh, the front page, at least it is uh, very <laughs> uh, cute uh, uh, with, the, with the Nordic um, uh, ministers from at least the four Nordic countries, uh, uh, sort of, uh, not, sorry, not ministers, uh, but um, ambassadors uh, to Canada at the time, uh, celebrating Christmas together. Uh, and I think this sort of uh, shows this very sort of, you know, in practice, in the everyday, uh, you know, <laughs> we work together and we, you know, uh, celebrate Christmas. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of the people told us that whenever uh, you are assigned uh, as um, 
ambassador to a new context, well, the first thing you do when you land or just before you land is you contact your other Nordic uh, ambassador colleagues uh, to see, okay, what's at stake here, you know, sharing information, uh, ways of working, and that is really sort of the, the core of, of, of why we end up working together on, in many of, of you know, contexts abroad uh, uh, is uh, that we can, uh, we share values, we share ways of working, this pragmatic approach, um, uh, and also we can multiply uh, influence on the ground if we, if we work together. Um, and then uh, I have to admit that uh, when we first talked about uh, the front page uh, <laughs> of this report, uh, which apparently will be central to my uh, just opening remarks here, is that we had this idea of this picture, uh, and uh, at least something similar, where there were like, uh, now I think there are seven swans here, but there were like five swans, you know, <laughs> moving along together uh, to create peace, but then suddenly it hit us, no, 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 this is uh, all wrong, it looks like this, you know, one directional, uh, you know, bird formation of the five Nordic uh, white swans coming to save the world kind of thing. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, it hit us how awful uh, of kind of a, a metaphor this would be. And, and not just because of its symbolism, but also it didn't really fit a, at all uh, the sort of interviews we had uh, with diplomats of the Nordic countries. Uh, so we, we've gotten with the, we went with this uh, bird formation uh, that was much more this organic uh, going together. And, and I think uh, actually because what came out in the interviews was Yes, we work together on the ground, but we do it in an, uh, what uh, sort of we ended up calling a non-exclusive Nordic uh, collaboration, meaning uh, it's not just the Nordics, you know, the, the bloc, uh, you know, going together. It's very much collaborating with all kinds of other actors. Uh, you can think of the Friends of Mediation with Finland collaborating uh, with uh, Turkey, initiating uh, the Friends of Mediation. Um, and in Norway collaborating with Cuba uh, when it comes to uh, peace talks in, in uh, Colombia and so on. So all kinds of uh, North-South collaborations. Uh, but the main thing here is that the other Nordics, they support behind the scenes. Uh, so uh, that's also the case for, you know, um, campaigns for the UN Security Council and other things. It's, it's not like now we come together, these five Nordic white swans to save the world kind of thing, but much more, you know, uh, also not this maybe, but much more it is, uh, you know, non-exclusive Nordic co collaboration with all kinds of partners, but then supporting each other more pragmatically uh, behind the scenes. Um, I don't know if we have more time mm. or you would well, uh, we will have time to uh, okay, okay. get back to that. Thanks very much for also a very thoughtful and interesting uh, image of uh, a very visual image of how Nordic cooperation uh, functions in practice. And we will continue on the track of, of uh, how it works in practice with you, Hayden, who has, you have worked in all corners of the world for different humanitarian organizations, and now you are working at WHO. So what's your perspective on, on Nordic cooperation, how it functions? Indeed, indeed. <clears throat> I probably have a slightly different take uh, compared to my fellow panelists because we have uh, peace researchers and then we have uh, a mediator. Uh, there has been lots of gloom and doom, but also lots of inspiration, luckily as well. Uh, revisiting the model, uh, I have, <laughs> obviously I have been drinking the Kool-Aid because as you said, I'm working for the World Health Organization. Uh, and I think sort of, based on the conversations that we've had, I think there is a red thread that we kind of agree that if there is such a thing as a Nordic model, that there is a need for a revision. Uh, just to put it out there, a couple of sort of uh, potential elephants in the room and also things we have touched on and other things we have not touched on at all. Uh, one of the first points on observation that I wanted to mention was, I mean, we've talked about uh, gender equality, that, that's one of, that's a big part of the Nordic brand, right? But in, in addition to that, and I know Cipri has done some work on this as well, as well as the World Health Organization, that health is a main enabler uh, for peace. So if we were to revise the model of the Nordic uh, peace, the Nordic peace model, health could be a strong uh, input into that. Uh, a good example would be if you think about the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, where you had suddenly across the world, that was a global issue where people felt threatened uh, in terms of public health, even in the countries where 
people would have thought that they were somewhat uh, untouchable. But it basically showed to us very sort of black and white that when health is threatened, you sort of threaten people's uh, human security, human safety, et cetera, et cetera. And another example also from the pandemic would be uh, in terms of the vaccines, because the distribution of the vaccines was unfair. Uh, so that sort of clearly showed us the in inequality and that then could have triggered into something. Uh, well, there were dipl diplomatic rows and there were, there were accusations, let's say, not necessarily global south, global north, but, but in more sort of complex channels. That's one issue, how health could be a potential sort of uh, tool if you wanted to revise the model. Uh, another thing that I wanted to bring up, just an observation, I thought it would, com would come up in the past two days, but it never did, well, or at least possibly in a very sort of limited uh, extent, and that's cracks in the Nordic image in the identity of the Nordic countries being sort of leaders when it comes to human rights, being leaders when it comes to certain values. Does it matter that what has happened in the past couple of decades, let's say in national politics, we can talk about refugee and migrant policies in the Nordic countries as an example. Uh, we can talk about the violence in Sweden in the past couple of weeks, right? Uh, and even how much money and resources the Nordic countries are putting into peace research and, and when they talk about it or if they talk about it at all. That's one issue. Is this an issue? Is this undermining the Nordic peace brand if we want to push it? And then finally, and then I'll, then I'll stop and then we can move on to take questions from the audience. Uh, this came up yesterday. What does it mean when we talk about punching above one's weight? Does that necessarily have to do with the size of a population? <coughs> uh, because there is a thin line somewhere there. We have this self-perceived idea about, on a, well, that's, that's how it's been sort of read, and it's kind of a negative way of reading into it. This sort of superiority, moral superiority of the Nordic countries. And then on the other hand, you have some sense of inferiority and you need to strike a balance there. Uh, so how do you sort of, uh, where do you strike that balance and what do you, which issues do you push? I came across and I wanted to read it out. It's a paragraph from a Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. It's 17 years old, but I think it's still valid. I believe there are two aspects of the new Norwegian character that we should be wary of. One is a tendency to be big-headed. We can come to believe that we are bigger than we are, that we in our peaceful corner of the world know best how others should resolve their most complex crises. The other is at the opposite end of the scale, a tendency to believe that we are smaller than we are, that we are unable to make any real difference. This is also wrong. Now these are the words of Jonas Gerstöre in 2006, and he's still in politics, as we know. Uh, he then continued and talked about that the Nordic peace model could not be used to promote Norway and that it couldn't, it couldn't be used to sell Norwegian salmon, is actually where he, where he ended up. <laughs> but basically, I think the words are still valid and it's something that we should, have, should keep in mind. And my, sort of my final thought would be that in terms of punching above one's weight, I think we should be deliberately doing that mm. and we should sort of leave that as a thing of the past and that we should continue promoting that model, mm. a certain model that would then need to be revised. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now you've heard uh, what we can call a scene setter about the uh, traits of, of uh, the Nordic peace model, what it has traditionally been associated with, but also uh, problems. Uh, is this, uh, as we've heard, the dinosaurs uh, relying on a liberal world order that is no longer the reality? Uh, or is this pragmatic Nordic uh, approach maybe something that uh, should be sh uh, safeguarded and also developed for the future? But I want to open up. I know we have Mike here and we have one question over there. It's difficult to see exactly with the light here, but I see one question there and a second one and please and a third one here. So maybe we can take three questions at a time and uh, uh, then we will go to the question to the uh, first round of questions. Yes, please. Yes, hello, my name is Petra Granholm. I come from the Åland Island Peace Institute. Mm -hmm. Åland is an island in between Finland and Sweden. Uh, at the Peace Institute, we have um, 
one of our main tasks is to pre present the Åland example to other parts of the world that are interested in, in, in what, what Finland and Sweden and other countries has achieved in, in Åland. The Åland solution consisting of the autonomy, the demilitarization and neutralization, and, and the minority, minority protection. So I, of course, come from a privi privileged minority. But today we have also heard about the, the plight of the Sami in, in the wind power uh, development in Norway. And we know we have other examples of that, that uh, the Nordics may maybe not are always um, doing so well when it comes to minority protection and, and of course also indigenous populations. So my question is maybe twofold. First of all, um, uh, we present the Åland example exactly as an example because we are very aware that, uh, as Marco said, peace cannot be exported. It has to be made locally, so it can only be an inspiration. It's not a model. Uh, but I would like to, to ask you, what, how are, can, can, the, can we still use the Nordic examples of peace in, in peacemaking abroad? But also reverse, is there something that uh, the Nordic countries could learn uh, from, from the global south, no, not from uh, peers like in the northern hemisphere, rather from the global south? Are there not imports we can do, but are there things we can learn? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Thanks. The lady in no, orange. Thank you. Uh, Sana Mandarlini from ICANN. Um, I wanted to follow up on the last point. Um, about the Nordic image and actually pose something for the audience and for the Nordic, the Icelandic presidency of the Nordic Council. Um, given what's happening right now in Israel and Palestine, the issue that we're faced with is that you have the, the Hamas massacre, which is horrific and unconscionable, and the Palestinians are gonna be haunted by it forever in terms of how they're gonna be treated. And at the same time, we have Israel dropping phosphorus on Gaza, uh, using water, energy, and food as weapons, and bombing, carpet bombing the place. And, and these are all war crimes as well. And the United States has just come in and said that they're gonna support them 1,000%. The question that I have for Nordic countries and, and others is that if we collectively, as smaller countries and as Europeans and others, stand aside in silence, while this is happening, or support the United States because they're the big boy and, and we, we do them like that we do as, as we did with Afghanistan. Essentially what we're doing is we're becoming complicit in enabling war crimes and more importantly, kicking the already very wobbly peace and security architecture and international rules and uh, you know, laws and everything that we've all grown up with, um, kicking it really uh, down to the ground, right? To what end? And so, so my question is, isn't this the moment for Nordic countries and for Europe to stand up and actually criticize both what Hamas did, but also not allow, I mean, stand against what Israel is doing, um, not only because it's wrong in Israel, but it's actually because it's bad for us and for the future of what we're standing for. And, and bearing in mind that if, the, if Israel and the United States can do this in uh, with Gaza, um, Russia's gonna do exactly the same thing with Ukraine. If, if food can be weaponized in the case of Gaza, they're gonna do it in the case of um, Ukraine. So the implications are huge. The entire world is watching this and it's exactly the same story as what happened with Afghanistan and the Taliban. It doesn't stay there. What happens in Gaza doesn't stay in Gaza. What happens in Afghanistan doesn't stay in Afghanistan. So are we at a point where as societies and as our countries, we're willing to stand up and say, enough of this, we need to, we need to stand for the values. Mm. So um, the Nordic image question comes into mind. Thank you, sorry for Thanks. the long intervention. And we have a third question uh, here at the front. It's at the first table here. Um, Mitra Hedman from Ocean Integrity. Uh, Iceland. Uh, my question is about, this was an amazing event. I enjoyed it very much. Everything was perfect, very professionally done. But how much of the peace funds go to 
research and, and you know, events and uh, um, champagne parties. I'm sorry to say that, that because I've been few of other organizations that overhead is much more than what translates to what is for, you know. How, is it any statistic, that, is, is any figures you say that this is how much it goes for the talking about peace and how much does it really go to peace making? Okay, thanks very much. Uh, okay, we have three questions. How can we uh, use uh, the Nordic example uh, um, to other peace settings, but also how can the Nordic peace model, what can we learn from other peace in, in and especially was mentioned in the Global South. The second is uh, how can the Nordics play a role in what's unfolding in uh, Israel uh, and Hamas, Gaza right now, and more specifically, can the Nordics set limits on what is expected to be Israeli counter-strike, um, which we don't see from other Western powers. And the second, the third question, uh, uh, which is a tricky one, is how much is going to the peace conferences. And um, I will open up. Uh, do you want to take a stab, Marco? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I can. And I perhaps i concentrating on the first question because I found it easier <laughs> to answer and not, not as, as a kind of a controversial and complex and I don't have statistics for the for the last one uh, uh, but I think it's open up the main teams as we had discussing how Nord are there Nordic models for peace and how Nordic models would kind of works for the others and I know that that there have been kind of a several kind of uh, 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 people uh, like CME has done it, and some other organizations have bring people of conflict areas to visit in Orland. Orland to see as an example of, of territorial autonomy, how we, uh, kind of the management issue. I'm, I'm just wondering what are the results on, on this? Is this a particular situated, historically created context? So I, I suppose there have been also people from, from Azerbaijan, Armenia, and it would be a wonderful solution for, for Nagorno-Karabakh. The realities are different. So then there's a limit how we can use these kind of models. And it's a wonderful story also how the Nordics, which fought so many wars during the centuries, becoming slowly in the 19th century, early 20th century, an area which you can even imagine any kind of a conflict among them. So it, it's, there's a good narrative, but can they be, as, as such, being kind of brought? I think that we perhaps too much think about that. That's we are the excellent model and nothing is wrong here. Mm. It is a good narrative to tell. And then the Sami example is, is great, that this is the kind of image to be kind of a progressive, something, is, everything is, is fine here, we just go there, and ignoring the kind of all our own problems, mm. seeing that this piece is, is, we have no problem with that. And I think that there's not many uh, kind of a committees with putting in the Sami to see examples how we are working with the Sami people. Mm. So that, that, that's one good example. Mm -hmm. uh, for the second question, I think that, that it's perhaps it's Nordic's image is, is to be more on a seeing as, as a kind of a, uh, 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 so far, uh, 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 as a peace nation, kind of excellent in fighting on national action plans for women's security, but not taking this kind of a, 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 a strong positions on 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 charging and 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 and, and, and taking kind of a, uh, uh, separate from other liberal powers where the Nordic still a part of them. So I think the, it is understandable in that perspective that that why Nordic are not taking any kind of a different position than than the, the other European or U.S. powers at the okay. moment. So it, it it's it's obvious, and I think we are going more in that direction that we're standing on the same side. Just yeah. Um, very good. Hannah? Um, excellent questions. Uh, thank you for those and excellent uh, inputs from Marco already. Uh, certainly, I believe that we have a lot to learn. Uh, we are not uh, in a position to teach the world, and I think that's uh, not the right, uh, right approach, and we uh, try not to do that um, at CMI, at least. I can uh, vouch for that. Um, it's all about, uh, of course, listening was mentioned already today and, and, and yesterday, uh, listening to other parts of the world and, and their experiences and, and learnings um, <clears throat> is, of course, very crucial. And then on, um, on the Nordics taking um, a more vocal role in, in uh, the current uh, situation in, in Palestine and Israel, 
I think uh, the Nordic countries, um, as you said, are not very uh, vocal usually, but I think there are differences also between the Nordics. I think the most um, discreet and silent uh, Nordic country might be Finland. Yes, it is. There's the, the civil society in Finland uh, very frequently demands for uh, more vocal action and, and speaking out. But that hasn't been the policy, and I, I don't see that changing uh, very, very soon. Uh, Sweden, perhaps, has been most vocal, especially in terms of human rights uh, questions. Um, on funding, um, uh, I think uh, most of the funding for peace efforts, at least uh, in my organization, is uh, development uh, aid funding. It's ODA, and that is very strictly um, uh, guided how to how to spend that money. So I can assure you that uh, uh, um, conferences like these, where um, the field gathers and and exchanges, are a very tiny part of of the budget that we spend. Um, even though I would be willing to uh, uh, defend also these events, uh, even though they are far away from from the actual conflict settings and. Uh, the sort of um, discrepancy here uh, is, is, of course, um, something we all feel. Um, policy exchange is, is critical and, and advances the field, and meeting colleagues is absolutely necessary. And as was mentioned yesterday, uh, the decision makers and, and research and, and practice people should come together even more so. Uh, somehow that also has to be funded, but it's a, it's a small, small drop in the ocean. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks a lot for excellent interventions and questions. Uh, firstly, on indigenous populations, uh, sure, there's a lot we can learn, and Sweden can learn from Canada and elsewhere. Uh, and also, I'm, an, I'm, I'm Danish, so I, I know more about the case of, uh, of Greenland and the sort of relationship between Denmark and, and Greenland. And here, uh, suddenly, uh, Greenland, uh, people from Greenland learn from other places in the world in terms of decolonization and sort of uh, how, for example, right now they just uh, finally got the right to speak their own language in our parliament, for example. So things like that, uh, my impression is that it's very much um, people from Greenland learning from other uh, processes of decolonization. Uh, so, so that's one point. When it comes to funding, uh, if we sort of, I will come back to uh, your questions, and I'm also. But when it comes to funding, I want to emphasize. I mean, I come from a country with no peace research center. There was Copri, the Copenhagen Peace Research Center, that was closed down in 2001. Also, no master degree or bachelor degree in, in peace research, and it has. Uh, it is related to policy. It is, uh, we need peace research, as I see it, uh, for, you know, of course, teaching students that will then uh, come into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and change, uh, or at least affect the, the foreign policy, uh, but also just to be linked up to the other Nordic countries. Uh, and also, for example, in the media, uh, being the only one focusing on peace talks in Denmark, even though I work in Sweden, the media have, uh, have to come to me when it comes to speaking about the peace prize or uh, any kind of um, peace mediation efforts or something like that. So it is important that we have knowledge on these things. And uh, I think the case of, is that of Denmark is really uh, critical as a case of <laughs> lack of peace research. Uh, Peter Wallenstein, the uh, Swedish professor of peace research, from Uppsala University, once called Denmark like a, hole, a black hole when it comes to peace research, <laughs> that was not. Uh, but, but it's kind of, a, uh, it is true, and I do, I mean, yes, it's, you know, we have these conferences and so on, uh, but I do think, as you mentioned, also like coming together, peace researchers with practitioners, uh, but, and also if you compare it to the uh, military research, you know, at least in the case of Denmark, which I know the most about, the, it's uh, huge, <laughs> so there's a lot. Uh, Today, and if you look at how, how much money is put into military efforts, it's, it's of course, you know, mind-blowing. So I think that's more the fight we have to have rather than sort of uh, having meetings or not, because meetings are critical for making uh, connections and relations and exchanging information and experience. And then uh, finally, uh, Israel-Palestine, and I guess just a broader comment on sort of the Nordics, Europe, not just lining up be behind the US. Um, 
And I think that is really a, a critical you know, point for, you know, for the future. Uh, and something that, uh, you know, <laughs> the last 10, 20 years, at least in the case of Denmark, less so for the uh, other Nordic uh, countries. So I'm a bit afraid, you know, with the, uh, <laughs> Sweden and, and Finland joining NATO, whether it will be even more, you know, just lining up behind the US. We even had a Danish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs saying in public TV, we don't even need a foreign policy, we just do whatever the US tells us to. I mean, he said that <laughs> out loud. <laughs> and that has been very much the policy, and when it comes to Israel, uh, or Palestine, Israel, that's certainly the case when it comes to uh, the invasion of, of Iraq, when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, Libya, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. So, and for the future, I think it's really, really important when we have a great power rivalry b between the US and China, you know, where will Europe, where will the Nordic countries sort of place themselves in that conundrum when if we have uh, some kind of military uh, uh, conflict over Taiwan, where, where will, will we just, you know, line up behind the US or will we be able to be more flexible uh, mediators pulling the strings uh, behind the scenes? Uh, not, of course, giving up on, on democracy or anything like that, uh, but certainly think through, you know, how can we uh, you know, not just uh, line up behind the US. I think that's critical. Thanks. Heide. Uh, on the first question, yes, I absolutely think that there is a need for the values that uh, the Nordic model sort of has uh, tried to uphold. Uh, and I think definitely that there is more opportunity when you do it <coughs> as a united Nordic bloc, if possible. Of course, there are differences, as we've talked about. Uh, and then again, and, and I think this might even be from some of your work, Marco or Isabel, that some of the values <coughs> of Scandinavian and the Nordic countries, they've been taken on board or taken over by, let's say, the European Union, et cetera, et cetera, in the policies they push. Uh, so then we're going back into the Nordic model having to be modernized and, and being revised. On the issue of Israel-Palestine, I probably have... A, I have a personal view, of course. I've worked in Gaza, <coughs> and personally, I would be of the view that I would personally like to see a stronger stance on what's happening in Gaza. But then again, this probably also goes back to the point that I raised earlier. <coughs> what is it that the Nordic countries stand for? And if that then goes against for what the model is, the Nordic peace model? Okay, thanks very much. And, and of course, Israel Gaza is a super complicated uh, issue. We have uh, also Norway taking a very <coughs> strong ownership of the Oslo process, and uh, it has more been a, that has been the leading Nordic actor uh, on that. We have Sweden recognizing Palestine, but today with a government that is more leaning on cutting aid, such as Denmark and uh, Sweden did yesterday, and several actors are warning of collective punishment. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not a situation where there is a block of Nordic countries acting in the same way, but uh, they are moving in different directions. This is also something that we would have liked to touch upon, how the Nordics are developing. Are they becoming more homogeneous or are they actually moving in a different direction? But I will open up for a last round of questions before we close. We started a little bit late, so I hope that we will be given the grace by the arrangers of five extra minutes. So please. I have a question here and there. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, I'm gonna stand up. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I have, of course, we have been talking about this, the whole conference and everything, but I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, and my question is, what specific initiative or policies do you believe that the Nordic countries can collectively pursuit to promote peace and stability both within the region and on a global scale and uh, how you how could youth organizations be an active partners in these efforts excellent thanks very much uh, we have had another question here at the first table Hello, my name's Loana. Um, I'm a freelance journalist and writing this up, um, amongst other things. Uh, I think from yesterday, I thought that the words truth and dialogue were like key words that kept cropping up. Kept cropping up. 
And today, agency was like a key word. What's your opinion on these? Okay, thanks. Agency. Well, agency. So do we have a uh, third question? Sorry, I said active, as I say, truth and dialogue, trust and dialogue. Trust and dialogue, yeah. agency. Okay, good. Uh, then I turn to the panel and I will give you all uh, a possibility to respond. And also, uh, as we are approaching the end of the panel, uh, if you have any thoughts on like, the Nordic peace model for the future. We have been touching upon this subject, where, in what direction are we heading? And uh, based on the discussions, based on your interventions and the previous discussions, what do you see as a model for the future Nordic? So I will reverse the direction and start with you, Haydn, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms of the future of the Nordic model, uh, and I think I mentioned this earlier, I would, I would bet on a unified model rather than, uh, rather than national Nordic, uh, basically sing single states. Uh, and then what we have been exporting based sort of, yeah, using some of the elements of the older model, gender equality being one of them, and then building on that. Uh, there has been a lot to take on board in the past uh, two days, lots of inspirational ideas. That would be my take on the Nordic model in the future. Uh, and in terms of the youth organizations, uh, and then I came to think of the climate movement, movement and, and the role that youth has played in that. Yes, I think there is a huge potential. Uh, and also having worked in this field, and I think it came from uh, Sanam yesterday in the, in the debates, that the imbalance that you have when you look at research into warfare and then you have, on the other side, you have research uh, into peace and then the financial resources that are spent uh, on, on armament and then, then the resources that go to peace research. So yes, that's huge potential that, that's, that's unused mm. as far as I see. Thanks. Thanks. Isabel? Thanks a lot. Is the microphone okay? I had to, yeah, perfect. Um, no, so... Uh, well, maybe, I don't know, trust, dialogue, agency, I'm not sure. I mean, these are critical uh, elements of, of, of peace. Uh, uh, there's a whole very interesting discussion on trust, whether it's really about trust in peace talks, for example, or what, is it trust in the other that's important, or is it more trust in the process? Uh, so there's all kinds of very interesting things to say about that, and sort of Nordic uh, diplomacy, dialogue, of course, agencies, critical supporting uh, agency of, of, well, women, local uh, partners, everything. So I, I'm not sure what <clears throat> more to say on that. Uh, when it comes to sort of ideas, for uh, Nordic collaboration and sort of youth. Uh, for sure, there's been a big uh, sort of climate youth movement, but what about a big uh, youth movement for peace? Uh, that hasn't really <laughs> been a thing. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, interesting why so. Uh, uh, and even there's been some, uh, I mean, at least in Denmark, I know, you know, uh, there's been some sort of tension between the old peace movement and sort of a more um, yeah, new movement trying to resist the old peace movement, a youth uh, sort of frank of that. So I, I think there's, it's interesting, you know, what, what could a Nordic youth peace movement uh, look like? What would they uh, fight for? And I think that relates to sort of the, the question that you posed in terms of what would the Nordic uh, model go for in the future when it comes to uh, peace mediation, uh, peace diplomacy. And here, if we could turn on the PowerPoint again, I wanted to, like, just shortly, uh, if not, it doesn't matter, uh, have uh, pictures uh, from this is uh, uh, an example during the Cold War where the Danish Prime Minister Jens Otto Kau invited Khrushchev to his home in this is 1964 uh, to uh, to his small town uh, house uh, to sort of um, sort of uh, nudge uh, him to uh, you know <laughs> 
be, um, you know, to, to generate the taunt basically between the US and the Soviet at the time. Uh, and also uh, another example is the Helsinki Accord, uh, Accords from uh, 75. So I think these examples from during the Cold War, I think these could be relevant to sort of re think in, in, in today's uh, world of, of sort of increasing uh, sort of geopolitical rivalry uh, and so on uh, between US, China, Russia and so on, could the Nordics do something to have, uh, you know, to support uh, diplomacy at this level? So not just us coming to other countries and, uh, you know, help them uh, mediate their conflicts, but also really think about the conflicts that we are involved in, in terms of sending weapons to Ukraine and so on, could we do anything diplomatically uh, to help this out? And I think the, the meeting uh, that was held in, in Copenhagen on the war in Ukraine is an example in point, uh, but much more, I think, could be done in this regard. So uh, that would be my final comment. Excellent. Thanks very much, Robert. And Hannah? Thanks. Um, first, about the youth, um, uh, inclusion of youth. Um, in peace processes, I think uh, your uh, question is very accurate and, and something to be taken very seriously. The um, youth peace and security agenda, of course, is still a bit younger than the women peace and security. And uh, we are still waiting perhaps to see the full implementation of, of that agenda in, in different national action plans and so on and so forth. But I think it's, it is something that we need to include in our programming and planning when we design um, processes and interventions and take that seriously. And there are a number of good examples uh, across the world already how that really can, can be made work. And not just as an add-on, like there's a youth forum separately somehow, somewhere, and then the sort of adults meet in, a, in the serious meeting, but to really uh, foster um, a real inclusion of, of young people whose future uh, we are talking about. So that's really a great um, point to be made, and also, Perhaps if you want to look up uh, Ahtisaari days that CMI is working on where we bring um, uh, conflict resolution skills to school environments and, and sort of try to make that a, a thing that everyone can practice in their uh, daily lives and sort of sensitivize the, the young people to, to questions of uh, peace and conflict. Uh, then about the, um, the critical terms of agency, trust and dialogue, these are absolutely uh, some of the key terminology uh, for peacemaking and, and something that we are planning to hold on very tightly to. Um, women's uh, political agency was discussed earlier in the feminist um, session, uh, feminist research uh, session today. Very excellent points were raised there, so I can't uh, top those up, but really um, agency is, is uh, of course a key issue. Then on the Nordic model and where that is going to uh, end up, um, that's of course um, not something that we can uh, determine here uh, in this panel. But I would also, uh, as Hedin was saying, hope that uh, some sort of unity uh, uh, is to be found and the cooperation uh, becomes even more strategic. And I would perhaps call for even more um, um, deliberate uh, cooperation uh, within the ecosystem uh, that we have in the Nordic countries. Uh, the state actors, the, the private actors, uh, different NGOs uh, working in the field, but also looking into um, different sectors across uh, uh, the field. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the triple, triple nexus, uh, actors in the humanitarian field uh, and development field. I would really uh, like to be in a conference uh, where that is uh, tackled, the cooperation in the nexus, but from the Nordic perspective. I think there's, there's um, something to look into, especially if we want to uh, perhaps take a step away from uh, over-securitizing peace. Mm. Thanks you very much, uh, Hannah. So, Michael, the, some last remarks. On yeah, the that, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, um, I'll start with the agency. I use these keywords in here, and I, I, I think that, in, in, in a way, uh, uh, talking about and looking for this kind of a Nordic 
unity or, or, or no, Nordic kind of doing something together is perhaps in wrong way. I'm more seeing that the kind of uh, the peace ecosystem is very diverse and the Nordic voices are also diversity. Except this diversity of voices, opinion and position is a richness of Nordics and, 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 and not, not looking for so much of a kind of a Nordic unity. But we needed a dialogue within the peace ecosystems that it's a, perhaps an issue that there will be. And this is why we need kind of how this kind of a meetings, um, another kind of meeting bringing to pick, uh, together kind of our, those who are working with the peace as a researchers, as a practicing as a policy makers. That is a certainly kind of a important to creating kind of a, this knowledge exchange uh, in, 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 in many way. Uh, then what I'm seeing that what the Nordics, well, but the first thing, the Nordic model is saying that we have to either refine it or, 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 or get rid of that altogether because it's a bit, a bit of burden. It always led to the idea that the Nordic is somewhere excellent, superior, have a kind of more progressive than the others. And it's hard to get the Nordic models without that. So maybe not even talk about that, but we can probably avoid that. But, but you have to do something, you have to have more humble, you have to, and I think my ideal case is, is, is I, I'm afraid that the, situ, the development is going more on instrumentalization or securitizing peace, but I want to call to see that the peacemaking is not something we call to for the others, it's concerning us. It may be some issues are very close to us, like we talk about how we kind of support Ukrainians, that, that, that's a real concern, but all the things, all kind of climate change, it, it's all kind of a, building up this common globe, the common systems, the global kind of a multilateral system which emerging there. So that it's not somewhere else, it's concerning us. And Nordics can be in the past, the Nordic actors as trust builders, uh, uh, creating untrusted relationships. They, they cannot alone do it perhaps much, but they are very much needed as a separate actors and not only be a kind of within this uh, kind of a Western bloc, but they have, I think that it, it, it's a, a freight, but hopefully Nordics continue to do the peace promotion also in the future. Okay, thanks very much for that critical, but also uh, thought-provoking call for reinventing the Nordic model, if we will stick to it. Isabel, you have two fingers in the air. Is it possible, <laughs> just two fingers? I just wanted to add, one thing is that we shouldn't be this Nordic bloc going to other countries together, this, this is our thing, you know, uh, su supporting peace, the Nordic peace model in that regard. But when it comes to foreign policy, I think it will be absolutely critical that we collaborate more. So the Nordic Council of Ministers doesn't include foreign policy. And if we had more on that, I think we'll be more able to, you know, uh, not just line up behind the US in the case of uh, Palestine, Israel and other cases, but actually to have a more joint foreign policy. So I just wanted to flag that. So when comes to you know solving other people's conflicts no uh, you know there we can you know not have a nordic model but when it comes to foreign policy i think it's critical that we have more collaboration excellent and there are several questions that we haven't discussed such as nato membership consequences for what, what does it mean for the nordic countries but uh, we hope that you will bring all these questions to uh, after the uh, closing remarks the closing remarks uh, will continue the path on youth involvement and we will hear them soon and sorry for uh, expanding a little bit on the time given. But uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for being engaged, putting good questions, and a special thanks to the panel. <laughs>